Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today at Intro to Fundraising and Ask Me Anything. My name is Eliana Gonzalez, and I'm a Senior Venture Associate at Capital Factory. What my role is, is talking to the coolest founders around Texas and recruiting them to what is the strategic partnership and super advisor that Capital Factory is. We, you know, maintain the most important relationships throughout Texas from venture funds, universities, accelerators, um, and other ecosystem partners throughout Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, and uh, Houston, of course, if you've read of the Texas Manifesto. Please go read it if you haven't. It's a great read for, you know, a Sunday afternoon or even a Thursday afternoon. But I love this event just because, you know, we get a chance to explain straight from somebody that has been an entrepreneur and is now on the venture side. We are going to be welcoming Jonathan Lacoste. And no, he's not, you know, inheriting the whole Lacoste uh, empire, but we're still super excited to be welcoming him to, uh, today. But before we jump into this big intro and welcoming Jonathan, I would love for our CEO, Josh Baer, to jump in and tell us a little bit more about what Capital Factory is. Capital Factory is the center of gravity for entrepreneurs in Texas. Thousands of entrepreneurs, programmers, and designers gather day and night, in person and online, for meetups, classes, and co-working. And with our team spread across the state in Austin, Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio, we meet all the best entrepreneurs in Texas and introduce them to the people that they need to meet most, investors, customers, and talent to grow their team. We watch all of this happen so that we have this unique insight into the market and use that to invest in all the best companies through our Texas fund. And we've been the most active early stage investor in Texas since 2010. Thanks, Josh. So yeah, like he mentioned, we have the Texas Manifesto. We're in every single city. I'm actually the first staff member in San Antonio. So if you're in San Antonio, we're so glad to have you here. But yeah, I mean, if you put Texas against every other world economy, we'd be the, we would be the ninth largest economy in the world. So that's super cool. Capital Factory obviously focuses in our own state. But now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jonathan Lacoste to the stage. Are you there, Jonathan? I am. Good afternoon. How's it going? Hello. So nice to welcome you. I always love, you know, for the person to introduce themselves. You know your story better than anybody. So tell us a little bit about you. I grew up in the Midwest in uh, Columbus and Cleveland, Ohio, uh, ventured out to Boston for undergrad uh, about three semesters in, realized it wasn't for me and a couple classmates and I had been tinkering on a software idea. So we raised a little bit of money and dropped out, spent the next 10 years building that software company and last year decided to uh, go to the dark side and uh, become a venture capitalist and, and launched a, a space fund. So. Awesome. That's a really nice summary. Well, everybody that's here, you know, we are going to be doing an ask me anything. Feel free to be asking Jonathan questions on the chat. We will be seeing them. And so we can make this conversational, Jonathan. We'll go from, you know, a couple of questions that we know that we have, and then we can take some from the audience as we go. How does that sound? Yeah, it's perfect. Let's go. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, you know, a quick bio was awesome. So tell us a little bit more about your background. You know, why did you decide to jump into being an entrepreneur? So I grew up with two teachers as parents. And so for me, I got my exposure to business and entrepreneurship quite late. Uh, in high school, senior year, my high school ran an entrepreneurship competition. I missed the deadline. And it's one of those like classic scripts from a movie where Three days after the deadline passed, I had a realization that I wanted to give this a try and convince the teacher to let me be a late entry. And not that that competition was all that impressive, but we ended up getting really into it, my partner and I, and winning the competition. And I think from there, it was just one of those things where once you get the entrepreneurial bug, you, it's kind of stuck with you forever. And so going from small town Ohio to Boston as well, um, being in, you know, in Cambridge in Boston next to all these wonderful entrepreneurs, both in university and, and outside. Um, it was just a mecca for me of, uh, you know, learning and intellectual curiosity, et cetera. So, um, you know, my background, uh, I was a business undergrad and so I didn't have technical skills. And so for me, it was about really understanding business models, how markets were evolving, how to really start a company from scratch, how to be a founder or a CEO, having never been a founder or a CEO. Um, how to fundraise, which obviously we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, and then, yeah, pretty much rolled up our sleeves and, and built, spent the next 10 years building a company. 
Awesome. Is there any first lesson that you remember from back then that you said, oh my God, I thought things worked this way, but now that I am on actually this side, this is how it works. One of the things that um, I remember looking back on was how sure we were in our first MVP, like our first product as, as when we were building and how sure we were on the problem we were solving, the customer and like that initial plan. And it's almost laughable now how wrong we were. Not <laughs> that the vision had changed, but like just the executionally it changes so much. So one of the things that now sitting on the VC side of the table, I recognized having been through that journey is I always take with a grain of salt, whatever a company is at the earliest stages when it's just a founder and idea, I almost uh, bake into the equation that their business is gonna change in ways that I can't anticipate and in ways that the founder can't anticipate. The question is really more, do you have conviction on the person who's starting the company? Uh, or do they have the traits and the characteristics to figure out, pivot, adjust, take feedback from customers as the market changes and kind of roll with those punches? Um, and if these answers, yes, it makes it a lot easier to write a seed investment as one example, versus if it's just someone who's very maniacally focused on one particular area, if anything deviates from that plan, they're not able to adjust. For a venture investor, it's much harder to get excited about that type of opportunity. Awesome. There you go. Tip number one, guys, for fundraising. They're looking at you as the founder. Awesome, Jonathan. Well, tell us a little bit about, you know, uh, your ventures, what you have done, and then, you know, we'll go more into now the venture side and why you started your own fund and your passion for space. Tell us about, you know, what first ventures, what was your startup about? And then we'll talk about that transition. Yeah. So I was the founder of a, of a software company called Jebit. Jebit is a modern day version of SurveyMonkey. So if you've ever gone to a website or received an email with a pop-up asking you to answer a few questions, to share some data about yourself. Um, SurveyMonkey, Qualtrics, Medallia, there are many billion dollar companies that were built 20 years ago that are still using a lot of the same tech. And we wanted to disrupt that. We thought in this millennial mobile first kind of digital personalization world that there should be a lot uh, more sophistication to that process. So, you know, our MVP that I was laughing about earlier was a website that paid college kids cash to answer market research questions. And now it's an extremely sophisticated enterprise marketing tech stack that links into Salesforce and uh, Shopify and others. So obviously it shifted over time. But um, one of the things that I learned the most about that journey and that company is still operational. It's a series C stage company right now. So we've raised, you know, tens of millions in private equity and venture capital. Um, what, one of the things that I look back on that journey um, is just appreciating how quickly certain markets move and how as a founder, you always have to adjust um, your, your product strategy, your go-to-market uh, strategy, and also your team too, the, the talent you need around you. Um, so yeah, that was Jebit. That was my first foray into entrepreneurship. And okay. the last thing I'll say is working in a business where your underlying customers were some of the largest brands in the world the NFL, the NHL, um, the US government, um, eBay and, and Amazon, Snapchat, Twitter, it forced us to really understand how all different industries and business models worked because at, at the end of the day, they were using our software to improve their business. So I felt like I got a world-class education, even though I dropped out of school in other business models and industries over the past decade in helping our customers. Right, awesome. Well, how did you become interested in space then? How did you go from that to all about space? I think probably like many of us, I started to, you know, you can always tell something's more than just like a passion. It's an intellectual itch when you start thinking about it in the shower, when on nights and weekends, you find yourself watching these boring YouTube video lectures with only like 20 views going through like the most mundane of physics or aerospace, but you're just fascinated by it. And for me, that was really the moment where I realized that there was something about space that intellectually intrigued me. Now, I'll be honest, that intellectual curiosity remained a passion for years where it was just something that I would casually do, picking up a book here and there, being in Boston. I often went over to the Harvard iLab and would talk to students or professors whenever we would go to San Francisco and I could sneak over to Stanford's campus. I would talk to, you know, a PhD students that were, you know, doing something in astrophysics as well. You know, just having those conversations maybe one or two times a month. But last year during the pandemic, maybe like for many people, it was an opportunity for me to take a step back and reflect on what are some of the largest paradigm shifts that we currently see in, in kind of our generation. Yeah. I think you could name blockchain and climate change technology and obviously cryptocurrency being part of blockchain, mm -hmm. um, renewables, personalized medicine, there's so many. Yeah. But for me, space tech was on that surface level of big paradigm shifts that could have 
multi-generational impacts that I was passionate about. Um, and so that's kind of the foray of how I started to explore and think about jumping into space. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's go a little bit more into now space fundraising and investing. Uh, what is, you know, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm in the space industry. What is some of the advices that you would recommend me to go do or don't do? Walk us through it. Yeah, I, I think um, at the earliest stage, a lot of the questions are really around like, how do I get in front of a venture capital? Like, how do I get access? It feels like this backdoor, um, you know, probably for too long, um, boys club of folks that just kind of uh, introduce each other um, and, and know one another. For me, what I would say is having been on both the founder and the, the VC side of the table, it's really about being focused on just building a great company and great product and investment will come. I know at times it doesn't feel like that, um, but the most important thing in terms of attracting venture capitalists is to build a great company, is to solve a huge product. And in order to do that, you have to have a, the ability to articulate your vision very crisply and succinctly to others that don't understand the problem nearly as well as you do. So if you're, um, you know, if you've come up with a new um, mechanical solution for a spacecraft, or if you're working on a new operating system um, for, for downlink or, you know, vertically integrated satellite, you probably know more about that particular problem than anyone else you're going to be speaking to. So you have to, it's an art of, and it's an art and science of persuasion. You have to explain to them why the problem you're working on is so important that it merits not only someone's uh, potential dollars, but also their time, their effort, their network, et cetera. You're going to have to do this for employees, for co-founders you recruit. So at the earliest days, spending a lot of time just reflecting on what are we building at the highest level? How do we articulate that? And why should this company exist today? Uh, that's something I wish as a founder I had spent more time on in the early days instead of just, you know, glossing over that and thinking I knew it because it's so important to everything else you do as a, as a founder and as a startup. So that, that would be the starting point. Yeah. Being able to explain it to a fifth year old, you know, five, fifth grader, I think it's really important. And I think founders also kind of miss the point that they're looking at it so closely that, that they miss the big picture of like telling that story, right? Awesome, Jonathan. It, well, exactly. Yeah. Founders, founders are so knowledgeable about like the in the weeds problems of the day to day, regardless of what stage you're at, by the way, if you're running a couple hundred person company, you're still in the weeds on that large customer that may sign or, or, or you know, cancel their contract. You're still in the weeds on like that one product thing that needs to be fixed before the next um, you know, product launch. But you need to be able to elevate above that and articulate the vision, um, both to investors and employees, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I've worked with a lot of companies and I just say like, okay, go pitch this to your mom and dad. Tell me if they even understand what it is that you're saying. You know, it's like, no, I don't. I have many questions, you know, and so it's just also telling your story successfully. Um, awesome. So a lot of the questions that we received were about how do I get plugged into an ecosystem that can help build my reputation, my company, and then get in front of the right investors. And so- mm -hmm. Let's touch a little bit more on that. You can talk about it on both sides. And so as the entrepreneur and, and as the investor, what is something that you appreciate from an entrepreneur that maybe is just starting being into a network or they don't have any idea where to start? Walk me through that experience and how you would solve it, having experience on both sides. Yeah, I'll start by the VC side and then I'll talk about how we approached it from the founder side. From a VC side, one thing that I realize now is just how many different types of structures there are within venture capital. Entrepreneurs and founders seem to think and put VCs all in one class, but it, it couldn't be more, um, we couldn't be more different from one another. And obviously some of that is depending on sector focus. So all we do at Space VC is invest in space companies. So I still get founders reaching out on LinkedIn about healthcare tech startups and marketplaces and consumer tech. And I'm sure those problems are really interesting, but we don't invest in those. So first thing, like do your research and make sure the fund is actually relevant for what you're reaching out on. The second thing though, is just structurally funds are built so different. So for all intents and purposes, Space VC is a smaller fund in the grand scheme of things. We're exclusively focused on space tech, um, but we are built to receive cold inbound from founders. Like that is the style of funds that we have. And when you have a meeting, you'll, you'll meet directly with me, the, the general partner of the fund, right? And, and anyone else on our team. For larger traditional venture funds, though, if you're trying to network your way in, 
you know, you'll go through an associate and then maybe you might have a meeting with a principal and then they'll bring in the partner for the last deal. And there's a much more structured process. Right. So just know when you're reaching out to a fund, what is their process? What structure of venture capital are they so that you don't um, set false expectations for yourself of I'm going to meet with the general partner and we're going to sit down for a two hour conversation and they're going to fall in love with my business. It just doesn't work that way. From the founder side, at the end of the day, investors take signals. We take signals from the ecosystem, both from uh, large, um, you know, in, in, in space tech, as an example, large aerospace prime contractors, some of the largest space companies, but also fast growing successful CEOs in the space industry. So if you're a brand new founder and you want to connect with a venture capitalist, one way is just to build a great network in the space ecosystem of end potential customers, of product directors, of founders of other space startups. Inevitably, it's about building relationships, not transactions. At a certain point, they may be you know, comfortable enough introducing you to the VC fund that led their seed round or to an investor that they met with you know, two weeks ago. Those types of connectivities are spontaneous but they're only built over time and you have to approach it with a relationship first mechanism. You can't, you know, just reach out to the CEO of a company and ask for an introduction to their lead investor. It's not going to happen that way. Awesome. There you go. Do you see yourself as an investor going to more events or do you see yourself as the entrepreneur going to more events and networking? I think just given the amount of time, like I spent 10 years as an entrepreneur and the last year as a VC, I will always maintain that scrappy nature of going to a conference and trying to, you know, find two minutes to, to find that important person and, and get yeah. a meeting with them. And, and that has worked from time to time. Mm -hmm. What I will say, though, has been the most successful form of connectivity for me has actually been perfecting the art of a really well-researched, succinct, cold email. People respond to cold emails if it is highly relevant and if it is short. And so if you reach out to me as an example or to any other VC and you say, and you tell me your whole life story or you tell me the entire problem of what you're solving, unfortunately, just given that the only constraint we have is time, that's not something that you're going to get a high response rate on. But if you do a ton of research, you see that we invested in a company that solves for uh, solar radiation prevention or for um, satellite rideshare, uh, space infrastructure as a service. And you're building a company that's adjacent to that. And you've also heard this you know, interview series and you heard me talk about you know, my viewpoints on vertically integrated satellite companies and you include that in your email and you make it three or four sentences, 90% chance you're gonna get a response and you're gonna get a meeting. That's only the first step obviously, but I think as an entrepreneur, I underestimated sometimes um, how important that research was because VCs, I mean, we get millions of messages a week and it's, and it's impossible to respond or even meet with all the entrepreneurs. Right. Just like in your presentation, you need a hook, you need a hook in your emails. Awesome. You know, there's a really interesting question coming in. This is from Calvin Kynes. Space is necessarily secretive, though. Do you think alternatives to the hackathon approach would be more suited to this particular sector? Mm, interesting. One thing that I like to do sometimes is to challenge conventional wisdom. Uh, Calvin makes a really good point which is especially in the US ecosystem with CFIUS regulation and national security and DOD and SpaceWorks and AppWorks, um, there's a lot of tie in between the traditional aerospace industry and uh, national interest, national defense. So there's, there's no disputing that. That said, early on, um, I have been surprised, pleasantly surprised, I should add, at how rarely, if ever, if you were to go and tell someone your entire master plan you know, as a, as a space entrepreneur or any type of entrepreneur for your product, how rarely people take that and do anything with it. Because innately, I find that people want to think of their own ideas and use it. And so even if you share the exact idea that you have, it might be interesting. You know, someone might noodle on that. They may even take it into action, but they don't have the exact vision you have. So to be clear, I'm not advocating for going and, and um, you know, advertising your unique proprietary approach if there's something within you know, thermodynamics that you figured out or propulsion that no one else has. But I do recommend entrepreneurs that are trying to keep their uh, company or product closer to the chest to actually be really liberal in sharing those ideas with people because you need feedback in customer iteration early on uh, to create the best version of yourself and your company. Um, so do it with people you trust, of course. Um, but that would be one piece of feedback. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit more about the space ecosystem. So you just recently moved from Boston to Austin. 
Tell mm -hmm. us why, what do you see in the space ecosystem in Texas? Well, there's no one center of gravity for space in, in the United States like there is maybe Silicon Valley, right? You obviously have the Space Coast in Florida with Cape Canaveral. You've got Southern California with JPL and, and, and a lot of other aerospace companies there. And then you have the Space Triangle here in Texas between Austin, Houston, and Brownsville. Um, Texas has really rich history, though, of airspace and aviation. Um, Texas was the first place where you know, military flights took off. It's where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin trained for the Apollo 11 missions back in the day. Um, you know, one of the world's largest, if not the largest uh, budget airline carrier, you know, Southwest is here. And I just tweeted about this this morning, but you know, SpaceX obviously has a lot of their operations down in Brownsville and they just put another $150 million rocket, um, uh, you know, facility uh, just north of Austin in, in Waco. So there's a lot of um, aerospace and space activity here. Um, I love being in environments, though, that are a cauldron for all different types of ecosystems, though. I don't want to be in an environment, even though I'm investing in space, that, that is exclusively space. At Space VC, we often take uh, the best approaches and tactics from other industries, especially software, and we try to apply that to uh, subsectors within space. So I love being surrounded by folks in real estate and blockchain, um, you know, crypto, cryptocurrency, um, fintech, consumer tech companies, because that, that exchange of ideas can actually make space companies um, much more powerful. So Austin's a great place to be. It's a great vibe. The weather's warm and uh, we've enjoyed it here so far. Awesome. I'm glad, Jonathan. So <laughs> let's talk about, you know, what uh, what's the appetite for space related investments? Tell us about, you know, why is it so hot? And yeah. It, I've never seen it this hot. And, and the first thing I want to clarify is um, everyone like myself who just jumped into the ecosystem within the past year, we are standing on the shoulders of generations of people that have worked since the 1960s to make this possible. So there have obviously been, you know, uh, government workers at, at NASA and other, you know, uh, space related agencies worldwide, ESA and, and, and JPACs, et cetera, uh, that have been doing this for decades. Um, even more recently in the commercial space age, there have been employees at, you know, obviously the big the big companies like the Boeing and the Northrop's and, and SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin that have been doing this for decades as well now, too. You know, I think I just saw that um, there's a tweet that said Blue Origin could now buy a drink because they're, they're 21 years old since their founding. Yeah. So these companies have been around for a while. And so we are standing on the shoulder of all of that progress, all of that capital. That said, one of the reasons that I jumped into the space in, in industry is because the unit economics have started to change. One of the most important ones that people f uh, focus on is the cost uh, of launch per kilogram and just understanding how expensive it is to get a space asset into space, right? And so the average um, satellite back in the 1960s, it cost around $500 million to get that satellite into space. That same satellite you can get into space for less than a million dollars today. And you know, I, I was pitched by a, a founder CEO a few months ago who is in college and he launched a satellite as part of his MVP on a SpaceX rideshare mission. And our MVP a decade ago was a website that barely worked. So right. just the, the acceleration in terms of not only the um, access to building off the shelf satellites um, to building software at a much cheaper um, and, and faster pace than ever before, but also just the democratization and access of space, mainly through the launch, which used to be a bottleneck, uh, which is no longer a bottleneck. Yeah. It just changed the unit economics and made space a venture investable category. So since 2017 was really, in my opinion, the inflection point where you started to see venture dollars pouring into the sector. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit more about individual startups. So how would you get started in a newly space focused startup? Well, regardless of if it's a space company or any type of company, I always believe that the CEO needs to be the shepherd of understanding the unique problem or pain point that you're solving for. Um, and it needs to be a big enough problem if you're approaching venture capital dollars um, that that market, if, if it were adopted by everyone, would have a multi-billion dollar outcome in terms of addressable market. So the first thing I would do if I were starting another company again, would be I would book dozens of coffees with industry insiders, people that you think could be your customers. And you're not trying to pitch them, you're just trying to really understand on a day-to-day -day basis, what is the unique pain point or problem that they have when they are um, you know, uh, you know, operating a satellite or when they are preparing for launch or whatever the specific problem is that you, you are managing. 
Um, and, and, and being able to, again, articulate that really clearly and build a unique value point around that, um, that differentiates itself. And then if you believe that that truly, um, you know, if you get enough validation from people saying, yes, this is a pain point. Uh, if I had the solution, I would pay X amount for it, or I would, you know, allocate these resources, or I would stop using this vendor or part and I would shift to yours. Um, that's the best way to start any company, not just a space company. Right. So how would you go about it? You know, I'm an entrepreneur. I have this really big vision, but I don't have the enough capital for me to even build my MVP. What is the best way for me to prove this concept to VCs to give me this money for me to then take that next step? The one uh, challenging aspect about space tech is that the feedback loop a lot of the time for product de development is long. So the mm -hmm. early stages um, for non-space sector companies, you'll see an MVP where maybe they have a few dozen beta users or they have app downloads or they have nascent revenue. Um, that's much more rare in space, although at Space VC, yeah. given that we focus on companies that have a, a, a significant software or data oriented business model, um, it is possible versus a, a company that's just building a, a rocket engine, as an example. Um, that being said, early on, I like to challenge entrepreneurs to be scrappy and think about finding investment dollars in non-dilutive ways before they approach venture capitalists. So instead of immediately going to VCs, um, they won't fund the company until they see some type of traction or, or, or product development anyways. Um, can you find non-dilutive dollars? Can you raise um, on a convertible note from some angel investors um, on friendly terms, not, not asinine terms, but just friendly, reasonable terms? Um, that give you a little bit of runway to do a feasibility test or to um, you know, build an MVP or to do some, some other type of you know, radiation testing. Um, I've also seen companies more and more going to their potential end customers, asking for upfront LOIs and having the customers subsidize part of the cost as well. If you're solving a problem that's a big enough pain point for some of these customers, they'll be willing to pay for part of it, uh, the developmental process as well. So I really like entrepreneurs that take a look at the full ecosystem of resources before they immediately go to VC. Um, I also think the last thing I'll say is um, you can get dollars from a lot of different sources now. 10, 20, 30 years ago, VC and Sand Hill Road was primarily the main way to do it. But I find that there are so many angels and angel syndicates. There are crowdfunding platforms. There are seed stage VCs. There are you know, larger VC funds. Um, there are accelerators, obviously. There are so many different ways to uh, acquire capital that you really need to be thoughtful about if venture is truly the right decision for your business right now. The answer may be yes for venture, but it may not be right at this moment. So um, I, would, I would really have a good answer before you think about why you need VC dollars. Awesome. Let's talk about the uncomfortability of asking for money. How do you get through that hurdle? I think... One way to think about it, and I'll put my founder hat on now that I'm on the VC side of the table. VCs live in the world of um, writing checks and saying yes and no all day. So it's very comfortable. They're professionals at um, spending or get, investing millions of dollars and understanding these huge allocations. So if you're a first time founder and you're like, oh my gosh, a million dollars is the most money I've ever asked for in my life, that bank account would look absurdly big. That's exactly where I was a decade ago when we started our first company. Um, you know, one, one piece of advice is to think about it maybe um, less emotionally and more as just like a logical part of your plan in terms of um, this is our opportunity. These are the steps that we need to take based milestone based approaches um, in order to hit these milestones. This is the team, the resources, the testing, um, the, the vendors that we need to bring on board. And in order to have that, you know, these are the goals we'd like to reach. And this is how much money we need. And I would I would think of it less as oh, they said they're not going to give me a million dollars. They're going to give me 500,000. You know, I'll just take it and go. But, but there are constraints. So if they're only interested in investing half a million, okay, how does that change the plan? Maybe we hire a little slower. Maybe, you know, the product development only gets to this stage. Conversely, if someone gets really excited about your business and they want to invest 5 million, but you're only raising 1 million, the answer might not always be yes. You know, it's not always better to go faster necessarily. Um, you know, these are additional initiatives we could add to our product roadmap and finish in a tighter window. But otherwise, that cash is just going to be sitting on the balance sheet. So we actually don't want to accept that dilution early on. So um, asking for money is, is always maybe a, a tricky thing for first time um, founders. The best way to do it is to get out there, practice, ask a lot of people for money first. Um, I find that angels are a really good way to practice. Um, they're friend, you know, they're, they're, they give friendly back too. 
Um, and then, you know, kind of get in front of VCs if you feel ready for that. Awesome. Well, what kind of resources, networks do you recommend somebody to get into as they start, you know, their st space startup or they want to just get into more of the network in it? What do you recommend? Yeah. In space, I've been particularly pleased by how many um, really high quality accelerators that there are. Um, so obviously, if, if you're in Texas, I would recommend getting involved in, in Capital Factory. Um, but, you know, we have... Um, you know, Space Fund, which is another VC fund here based in Houston. Um, they just launched an accelerator. Seraphim Space Camp is, is kind of regarded as, as the most established one. They're based over in London, but it's a remote accelerator now. So in this era of COVID, you can participate from anywhere. Starburst Aerospace has a really good one. Techstars has a, a accelerator. So there's no shortage of accelerators and communities that you can tap into online. And they all have different terms in terms of commitment and funding and dollars and dilution. So take a look at what's right for, for your company. Um, but I actually think it is it is easier than ever before to tap into these online communities in a remote work world. People are way more comfortable making connections, doing Zoom calls, writing checks into companies that they've never met in person before. Yeah. You know, traditionally you would have been constrained by, can the partner at the VC fund, is, is, is he or she willing to fly to your city that you are located for a board meeting you know, three or four times a year. Um, right. Now that constraint seems gone. Now, you know, it, 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 you know, we have investments in Atlanta and in Scotland and in California, all over the world. And so, um, yeah, don't, don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Join as many of these, uh, you know, the ISS has a national laboratory um, research day that's open to the public in two weeks. Join that and check it out. Um, ESA, the European Space Agency, has an investors roundtable that they hold where they let startups pitch. You know, don't be afraid to fill out that form and just attend and, and watch. Um, there's ample, ample resources that you can find online just by following people on Twitter or you know doing some Google searches. For sure. Uh, what point of a startup would you recommend somebody join or have a strategic partner like Capital Factory is, or you know maybe a little bit early on join an accelerator? What, at yeah. what point as a founder do I seriously consider to give up some equity to this type of strategic partnership? Yeah, I will. Um, and you'll have to let me know if you agree or disagree. Yeah. Um, so my previous company, we did an accelerator. We did Techstars Boston back in 2013. I found that to be a tremendous experience. We met future board members. Our first investor who led our series seed came from that accelerator. Mm -hmm. um, it challenged us on a weekly cadence to improve. It put us in a community of other entrepreneurs to get sounding board and feedback on. It was fantastic experience. A lot of our advisors that I'm still friendly with today um, came from that experience. That being said, I think the primary reason that that was so valuable was because I was a first time entrepreneur. Now, I'm not saying that if you're not a first time entrepreneur, you shouldn't do something like that. But I think the, the, the main alpha of that benefit came because I was a 19 year old college dropout and I had no network and I had no experience starting a company. So that's really where I find like accelerators can be very helpful. But if you are a software developer and you work at Microsoft or Facebook and you have a really interesting idea for a new software approach to better organize and create analytics around, you know, SAR or um, thermal or radio frequency data being collected from satellites, but you don't know anything about the satellite or aerospace ecosystem, accelerators can also be very helpful into tapping you into that as well. So um, it depends on where on the spectrum you lie in terms of your experience as a founder and also your, your quality of network and, and who you need to get plugged into. Right. There you go. Awesome. We have some time to continue to take some questions. If you're in the audience, please, you know, make sure to drop them. Jonathan, is there anything else that you would tell somebody that maybe I just haven't touched on? One thing that I get really passionate about, and this is something that I'm focusing on every day within the space ecosystem in particular, is um, we are trying to build at Space VC basically the Andreessen Horowitz of space venture capital firms. And our main thesis uh, to, to steal from Mark Andreessen is, is that software is eating the world. We believe that space is at an inflection point now where software is also um, disrupting uh, tremendous aspects of the aerospace um, and space tech, uh, you know, kind of legacy supply chain uh, way of doing things. And so um, I think there's, you know, a lot of attention is being paid in space tech from a media standpoint into launch as a category. There's over 150 launch providers. 
um, into you know different satellite operators, uh, you know internet consumer services, space tourism. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with these fields, but um, I would just share maybe if anyone's interested that the areas that we are really excited about are um, businesses that look and operate more and more like software companies that happen to be operating satellite companies. They may, or satellites, they may not even be building the satellites themselves. They may be outsourcing that or having another company manage that for them. Uh, but they have a really unique proprietary sensor and they're wrapping that proprietary data around some analytics or they're an analytics or a software uh, data piping company and they're aggregating data from different satellite providers. So there's just a whole ecosystem of software and data oriented businesses that we are really excited about at Space VC. Um, that I would encourage people if you're interested to do some research on and check out too. Awesome. So could you share with us a couple of maybe whether you're portfolio companies or not of, you know, startups that you're just really excited about, tell us what they do and why you're excited. Yeah. So I'll give, I'll give some shout outs to some, some portfolio companies first, and then maybe I'll, I'll mention some uh, other <laughs> okay. uh, companies as well. Um, so we invested in SpaceX. We, we invest at all stages. So pre-seed to pre-IPO. Um, so as soon as we started the venture fund, one of the first things we wanted to do was acquire some SpaceX shares. So we, so we participated earlier this year. Um, tremendously um, excited about um, Starship and the capacity and what that, that's going to do for payload. I think it changes business models in ways that people aren't thinking about in terms of if you have a structure that large and if it's reusable, um, the amount of infrastructure you could get into space and what that could do. So I think that's really intriguing. Um, I, th I certainly think, by the way, Starlink is also extremely intriguing for a variety of reasons um, that I can't fully share why. Um, on the earlier stage side, uh, one of our most exciting portfolio companies, Loft Orbital, um, space infrastructure as a service, um, is performing tremendously well. It's a core thesis of ours that as the space ecosystem expands, there are going to be more and more what regular commercial companies, um, financial services, consumer product, agriculture, that become customers of space companies and need easy access to satellite infrastructure and getting their sensors and, and cameras in space, uh, but don't want to go through the, the very complicated work of building or buying or assembling or managing the entire satellite process. Um, and Loft Orbital manages all of that, and, and they're doing a fantastic job. Um, the last company I'd shout out is Space Forge. They're based over in the UK. They're doing in-space manufacturing. So uh, if any of you have tried to go and buy a car recently and you're, you're confused by car prices and why there's a shortage of cars on the lot and you hear that Ford isn't, you know, doing, uh, you know, making F-150s anymore, um, you've probably heard of the big semiconductor chip shortage that is, is currently happening. Um, and there's a whole bunch of constraints with that, some that are related to COVID, some that are related to rare metals. Um, but one of the things that we're excited about is the opportunity for microgravity to enable higher quality, pure silicon wafers to be um, created in space and to actually bring those assets back down to earth to help the semiconductor industry, which powers the shift to renewable climate change tech, um, 5G infrastructure, electric vehicles, et cetera. Um, so, you know, we think about them more as like a semiconductor company, but they happen to be building uh, in, in these in space, which is pretty darn cool. Um, yeah. So I think that's really interesting as well. That's awesome. So I see Calvin has another question and it's about one of Capital Factory portfolio companies and I'm sure you know all about them, Icon 3D. So he says, new uh, Austin company, Icon 3D has this model, they 3D print homes terrestrially to build knowledge and transition to lunar structure 3D printing. Do you consider their MVP here on earth to be a stepping stone or a stumbling block for them to get to the moon and Mars? Hmm. It's a really interesting question. Calvin, I, I love the uh, the questions you're coming with today. Keep them coming. Um, uh, truthfully, I don't know enough about the company and I wouldn't want to you know, judge them right or wrong um, publicly without having talk, spoken with the founder and, and going deep on their business model. One thing I will say though, that is, is indirectly answering this question related to our focus is we believe that there's a lot of investment happening in space tech and not all of it is commercially viable today. And we focus on commercially viable space tech. So if there's a way for this individual company to prove out the model of 3D printing homes terrestrially here on Earth, that's probably the best path for uh, revenue and MVP products, um, you know, much sooner and faster than, than having any type of like lunar scale uh, module. Um, I do believe that there will be, you know, 3D printed ho uh, homes on the moon and on Mars within the next decade or two. 
Um, the issue is just commercial viability of that. And is that something that's government funded to start? Or is that something that's funded through venture capital dollars? Um, so we typically look at, you know, things that are commercially viable now that uh, businesses both within space and outside of space need. Um, so very cool, but maybe not uh, commercially viable by our standards uh, today. Right. And, you know, I toured Icon 3D about a couple of months ago. And of course, they told us about they just closed the $266 million round, right? And Capital Factory was the one that connected them to NASA and the DOD side of things to, you know, make these on the moon. And so what I can tell you, you know, obviously their terrestrial MVP is, you know, they have IP on the way that the cement is built with water. Obviously, you mm -hmm. can't put water in the moon. And so the way that they're activating literal lunar dust is through lasers. And so they're working on that MVP uh, to be able to, you know, build the next launch pad, because once we land in the moon again, we got to get back. And so they are going to be the ones and they have the contract to build the next launch pads and obviously roadways when we once we get to the moon. And so I don't know if it's a you know, I wouldn't consider them to be a stumbling rock. Like you said, Jonathan, mm -hmm. I feel like you, it is um, a building, a stepping stone to them getting to that next level, you know, and it's just it was just really exciting when we made that connection to NASA and them, you know, moving to the moon and Mars potentially also. So Absolutely. I, I, on, on that note, though, I'll, I'll add really quickly. Yeah. I think the definition of a space company is also changing. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, space is a collection of a bunch of different industries. And so as using this as an example, I don't think it's a bad thing. If anything, we look at it as a, as a positive for a company to have application beyond space. You don't have to be a pure play space company. And if you do anything to help terrestrially or here on earth, that's a negative. Um, it just depends on what type of business or product you're building. If that makes sense to start with that terrestrially and then go to space um, or vice versa. If there's applications beyond space and aerospace, um, once you have you know a product and, and some recurring revenue. Awesome. We have one more question from Grace. This is quite nascent, but you said AMA. We have calculated TAM, SAM, and target market value. How does this tie into our initial valuation and how much we raise in a pre-seed round of funding? Mm, it's a really good question. I don't know that there's going to be a correlation between, um, I mean, broadly, the correlation between TAM and your pre-seed valuation is going to be the larger the TAM is, the higher the valuation is. But I, I don't think VCs think about it in terms of like, academically and mathematically going through that, I would say it's much more of a one or a zero. Looking at your TAM, do they believe that this is a large enough market to support a multi-billion dollar outcome? So I would spend more time focusing on that to address their question. The valuation is going to come down from a variety of factors. How much money they're putting in, what ownership percentage they're looking to invest in, the experience of the team and their conviction around the opportunity, how much, you, how far you've developed. Is it pre-revenue, pre-product, one founder, an idea in a slide deck, that can get funded, but it'll get funded at a very different rate than a group of founders that have been bootstrapping for five years and this is their first venture around their raising. So um, to answer your question, you know, definitely a correlation. Definitely you wanna be really thoughtful about what you put in your TAM. That's the one thing that, you know, sometimes I, I, I would never roll my eyes in a meeting, but I question, I should say, um, because I've been on the founder side and I, I wanna paint this huge vision of TAM, but sometimes as a VC, you know, I would rather entrepreneurs just be honest about what truly is. And we've all seen the big, you know, multi-trillion dollar markets that they're attacking. Um, just be really specific with your TAM and have a good story for how you're going to be able to solve those problems. Awesome. We are running out of time. So guys, if you have any other questions, this is the time for you to ask. I do have another one. So I'm a founder that I don't have any connections to VC or the startup ecosystem. How do I start? My recommendation would be, um, you know, attend all of those um, in-person networking events and conferences, both through accelerators and just through demo days. Um, I've actually recently, I don't know if this is a COVID era thing or if I'm late to the, to the trend here, I have found amazing communities in just different Slack groups and communities that I've been a part of. Um, and so that, that's something as well that, you know, you have to find your tribe and it depends on what you're trying to network in. And uh, again, I'm not going to say that you're going to become best Slack friends with a VC, um, but, you know, finding connectivity to others in the ecosystem, whether it's other startup founders, whether it's executives at other high growth companies, whether it's someone on the governmental side, right? We, we look a lot at AFWorks and, you know, innovation program managers at NASA and, and you know, Starburst Accelerator and, you know, um, uh, Techstars Accelerator um, as well, uh, Capital Factory, to make those introductions to VCs. So if you're able to connect with those folks, um, that's, that can also be a great, uh, you know, method for connectivity. 
Awesome, Jonathan. Well, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, what would you like to wrap up today with? I'll ask you a question because you've been asking the questions the entire okay. time. Would you ever go to space? <laughs> um, interesting question. You know, I don't like heights, but I okay. probably would like to go to space. Uh, I don't know if I freak out. I do remember when I was little and I went to like Fiesta, Texas, and it was this roller coaster. And I was like, okay, that's too high. Like, stop going up. But <laughs> I'd probably go to space. Would you go to space? I think I would too. Yeah. I, I think one of the things um, I'm really excited for is the potential to have uh, and, and see, you know, experience the overview effect where you can just look down and kind of see the entire planet in, in its natural beauty. Um, that's something I'd love to experience. Gra microgravity and gravity or, or lack of gravity would be cool too. Um, you know, just kind of floating around, but um, yeah, mainly for the overview effect, but I don't need to be up there for months. I, you know, just going up and hanging yeah. out for a little bit would be fun. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, I actually grew up around NASA. I went to Clear Lake High School. If anybody's from Houston and they know where that is. And I do remember, you know, I, a lot of my friends' dads, you know, one of them like fixed Hubble in 2009. And so me being mm -hmm. you know, a first generation immigrant from Mexico, just hearing about these like guys that I was like watching on the garage, I met, you know, Massimino, he was the first one that tweeted from space. Uh, and just being around that ecosystem, you know, just kind of like opened my horizons as, uh, you know, a little eighth grader. Uh, but it's just amazing how much we've gone, you know, we've progressed throughout the years. Uh, you know, meeting you that you are one of the investors that's pushing this. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being a part of Capital Factory Network, uh, being those VCs that we send deal flow to. Um, but that's it for today, guys. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to say anything else? No, just if you're building an interesting space company, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're always happy to, to meet with new folks. Um, and the last plea I'll make is, for too long, the aerospace and space tech sectors have been dominated and, and you know, a lot of the representation uh, look like people like me, white men. Um, it is really big and important for us, especially at Space VC, to make sure that we change diversity. And that starts actually, as you were saying, back in eighth grade, you know, um, in exposure and letting people know that they have access to this. So um, if you come from a non-traditional background, if you're afraid to break into space tech, uh, please also reach out and we're happy to help. Right. Mentorship is everything. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us today to uh, Introvertive Fundraising and AMA Space Edition with Jonathan. Thank you so much, and we'll join you at the next event.